Hello, everyone. This is Steve uh, Glazner, uh, APA's Director of Knowledge Management. Welcome to the first day of APA's Facilities Symposium and today's session entitled The Adaptation of Smart Campus, a Supply Chain Strategy. Note that this is a change from the original session listed in the program, which was how you balance the freedom of movement on campus. Um, I'll be serving as your moderator for today's program. Uh, do note that this is a pre-recorded session, but we do have Steve An uh, Anson and Andrew Jimenez from Annexter here live to answer your questions at the end. We will be posting the recording and Q&A after the symposium concludes, which will be accessible to all of you and uh, any of your staff through January 22. All attendees are in listen-only mode. If you haven't muted yourself, please do. Uh, that will help the, uh, the recording go a lot better. Please use the chat box function to enter any questions you may have. You can enter those, uh, those questions at any time throughout the program, and we'll be monitoring the chat box uh, and answer your questions, uh, pose them to Steve and, and Andrew um, at the end of the session. If at any time you experience technical issues with your visual or audio, please also use the chat feature to bring that to our attention. And it's now uh, my pleasure to present the Annexter team. And uh, here's the recording. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's town hall meeting on the adaptation of smart campus infrastructure, a supply chain strategy. My name is Steve Anson from the Customer Solutions Team at Annexter and I'll be your moderator for today's discussion. This session is the fifth in our series of industry conversations that will address not only the campus, but also cities, buildings, healthcare, data centers, and the digital divide. Before we get started, let's go over a couple of housekeeping items for today's discussion. You should see a control panel in the upper right corner that you can minimize with the orange arrow. You have an, a choice of computer or telephone audio to select from, as well as an option for audience participation via the questions pane below. You may send in your questions or share comments at any time during the discussion. We'll collect these and address them both during and after the webinar. This town hall would not be possible without the collaboration and support of our supplier sponsors, all of whom have relevant solutions to support a return to campus strategy. Thank you for your continued partnership. And thank you everyone for joining today. A very big welcome to our panel of subject matter experts from Microsoft, Michigan State University, Intelligent Buildings, APA, and George Brown College that will provide some insight on today's topic and are available to answer questions. But just as importantly as this is a town hall meeting, we really want to hear from you and encourage you to provide your thoughts and comments, comments on how you are solving the need for adaptation of your campus facilities. To keep this interesting, we'll be running a couple of live polls, so please make sure you contribute to the poll in order to have your say. According to key homes of UNESCO, educational responses to the crisis are capable of changing the meanings, purposes, and values of school, and could potentially help to shape more humanistic futures for education and learning worldwide. And according to a recent McKinsey study on student enrollment, there is a lot of uncertainty around students' first choice of schools with the concerns of cost, distance, and high COVID threat states. And interestingly, the report also indicates new students are just as concerned about remote learning. So Landa Medlin, welcome to today's discussion. And as the Executive Vice President of APA, the leading association for educational facilities, and after countless conversations over the past three months, do you believe that universities can mitigate safety concerns and still take advantage of the students' readiness for an in-person experience? I do. And Steve, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be a panelist on this webinar. I'm really looking forward to extending um, the conversations throughout this hour about 
the APA Smart Campus Strategies Summit that we held last March, this past March in San Jose, California. You know, since that time, I've been um, engaged in delivering weekly town hall meetings like this one concerned with uh, targeted topics, facilities topics that are impacted by COVID-19. And we are laser focused on a fall campus reopening. And fr frankly, never before have our facilities um, knowledge and expertise been more important. Uh, we are being asked to weigh in on every planning and operational delivery aspect of the campus. And so indeed, um, we believe that we are ready and we are moving in that direction. But let me share with you one thing. Bill Gates recently said, the world needs our leadership and coordination. He was talking about the United States at this point. I would suggest that our institutions, our companies, our organizations need our leadership and coordination. Because frankly, the operational aspects at every turn are daunting. We come with an ability to solve problems. We always have and we always will. But it must not be done in a vacuum. It has to be done collaboratively to lead and develop effective campus-wide strategy. So we're preparing our campuses for an uncertain future, but we are certain that we can bring them back safely and we know they want to come back. Thanks, thanks, Lander. And clearly, clearly your leadership's playing a role here and nice reference to Bill Gates, Emmanuel. Um, Emmanuel Daniel from Microsoft, thank you for joining us today. And as the Director of Applied Innovation and Incubation, Smart Buildings and Campuses, how much of this in-person experience relates to why a campus existed in the first place? Yeah, thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be on the panel and, and thank you for the opportunity. So from, from our perspective, I think it is important to, for people to be able to collaborate online, but we also believe that it is even more important for the physical and digital worlds to collide. Meeting in person drives or spurs innovation in a way that you just can't do online. Accidental collisions where people just come together, randomly think of ideas, are able to spontaneously get into brainstorming sessions. We've noticed there is a big difference from planned meetings that happen online and that are scheduled and unplanned meetings. Unplanned meetings spur that creativity within a person that if they are thinking of something, if they have a thought, if they have an idea, and they would like to immediately discuss it and work on it, that's what an in-campus experience provides. So bringing people together, having that physical construct there for them to do what they do best is, is why it is important to have digital and physical worlds coming together. It was really a lot of things we take for granted until they're, they're removed from us. and. Um, interesting insight there with with the angle of innovation um over to rick if i could uh, rick hybrix the leader of digital in sorry digital transformation and innovation uh efforts at george brown college what is your institution doing to mitigate risk in getting students back on campus yeah thanks Stephen. um we are i think like every other institution uh, actively working on figuring out how to get our students back starting this summer, but particularly for the fall. Uh, like most other institutions, we have a great dependency on international students from a revenue perspective. And with all the uh, uncertainty of traveling and visas and what else have you not, um, we're uh, with great concern looking at what uh, fall, fall could bring. We're trying to minimize access to campus uh, for the few months, next few months to come, uh, with a big focus on online education, which is tough because as a college, we're kind of known for the hands-on experiential learning that we provide to our students. They come to campus to be in labs and to build things and to collaborate. And for many of our students, this is a very difficult switch uh, to, to be online. So preparing our faculty to deliver amazing online experiences, preparing our students with the right tools and technology so they can effectively participate remotely, and then creating all the health and safety measures on campus for those students that need to or must be on campus in order to complete their studies is where uh, we've dedicated all our teams for uh, the summer. Thanks, Rick. And I think we're going to unbundle some of that uh, physical, digital, and experiential learning aspects throughout the webinar today. Um, 
and Rob, as it relates to some of these physical aspects, not just technology, um, you're the co-founder of Intelligent Buildings, and just like commercial buildings, uh, these areas are currently undergoing major transformation. What are some of the examples that you've seen um, in place? Uh, thanks for having me, Steve. Yeah, there, there, there is a definitely a, a transformation that's taking place, and yes, it's true. The way we're we're we're, we're learning it is changing, and today much of the disruption we're seeing is focused on slowing or mitigating the spread of of, of the of the virus, um, and that's falling into I would say two general categories. The first is fairly visible. Uh, which is around behavior, right? As the pictures you have here demonstrate that the more visual examples that, that enable us and remind the occupants of a campus or in Emmanuel's case at Microsoft, employees and visitors to stay at a safe distance and wear PPE uh, equipment and so forth. There, there's, a, there's a less visible aspect of things that we're seeing, seeing in the transformation um, that, that deals with, uh, and we were chatting before this call, around uh, overall indoor environmental quality, which is while it's less visual, uh, visible to us, um, things like increasing the ventilation rate, uh, it is also quite challenging um, in very old, in, in older buildings that come across, uh, across many of our campus, uh, campuses. And I found it interesting in a, in a book that I was reading recently that uh, we spend 90% of our time indoors um, as Americans. And, uh, and just as a, a fact that that's more than time that some whale species spend underwater. And so as we look at this transformation that's happening uh, for, for our students to get a positive learning experience, the, ra the ranges of uh, deploying different things from uh, working harmoniously with uh, our national, our natural or circadian rhythms, um, to sending, uh, to looking at particulate matters in, inside of our spaces, uh, that 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 is it's transforming how we need to leverage uh, the technology that that it is in buildings. Uh, but first, it's a business conversation. Thanks, Robin. I think we look forward to the rest of the webinar where you're going to contribute to how we compare a smart campus maybe to an intelligent building. I think as we spoke about earlier today that it's really about healthy buildings. So um, as we now ask Sabrina as Chief of Staff at Michigan State University, really keen to hear from you. Can you um, possibly share how your teams in very short order have adapted your campus environment for returning students, and maybe also give us some contrast between um, how Michigan State learned from the Spanish flu over 100 years ago. Yeah, Steve, thanks for having me. Um, so it's really interesting to talk about the adaptation of our campus because we've essentially gone through, excuse me, two adaptations. So when we had everyone exiting campus, we really um, focused on getting as many people off campus as possible um, and had to figure out how to maintain uh, that campus throughout the summer with as little resources as possible, going from around 1,300 staff members to maintain the infrastructure and systems to um, 80 at most on a good day. Uh, so going into the fall, we're ramping back up. We have more people on campus, um, and we are adapting the physical spaces um, using guidelines and recommendations from entities across America and, and locally. Um, thinking through pedestrian flow throughout buildings and using various types of barriers to reduce contact, of course. One of the major parts of our adjustment is in our cleaning and in our custodial services area. So our leaders in this area have really developed a comprehensive plan that allows us to address three major areas of cleaning, which is cleaning for health and in response to the virus and the outbreak cleaning for comfort, um, because we know that everyone is coming back with a set of anxiety around re-entering physical spaces, and then also providing tools and resources for individuals themselves to do a little bit of cleaning. So we're looking at carts and kiosks that contain the right uh, materials to take care of their own health and comfort. Um, so interesting that you bring up the Spanish flu. Uh, we definitely have had some experience um, in responding to pandemics in the past. Um, at that time, we were MAC, not MSU. 
Um, but during the Spanish flu, we had things like quarantine passes and quarantine districts. And now you see that we have uh, sent and are requiring as many people to stay home as possible. And as they come back, we're implementing organizational wide screening surveys, thinking about how we would implement testing requirements. And we're thinking about how we would um, employ, like, employ uh, contact tracing applications. Uh, during the Spanish flu, we were focused on protecting others uh, using your like face masks and surgeon's robes. Um, and now we have policies that everyone must wear a face covering no matter if they're indoor or outdoors. And we as an institution are focused on how do we uh, supplement the larger communities in the creation and innovation around PPE for um, the larger communities around us. Right. So we have learned from that Spanish flu, but I guess the point I would like to make is now we live in a world where we have access to more data um, in a real-time fashion, and it is our responsibility as a campus to use and provide that access to real-time good data to make the best decision possible, because that is the key effectively to being able to evolve into the next normal. Uh, in interesting contrast there, and I, I suppose, um leveraging technology and data um, and through a smart campus to to prevent and mitigate this problem as much as possible is, is at our fingertips and hello everyone and welcome to today's town hall meeting on the adaptation of smart campus infrastructure a supply chain strategy my name is Steve Anson from the Customer Solutions Team at Annexer, and I'll be your moderator for today's discussion. This session is the fifth in our series of industry conversations that will address not only the campus, but also cities, buildings, healthcare, Michigan State learned from the Spanish flu over 100 years. Please select one of those responses on the screen. And whilst you're doing that, I might go to Landry if I could, as the industry representative of higher education, what sense are you getting from, from your community about return? Well, it's really fascinating. There's survey data on students, and students are, two, at least two thirds of them want a full return to campus. So we do have a community that wants to come back, what Emmanuel was talking about, a rich experience. Um, we also have so many institutions that are just like um, what Sabrina described at MSU. Um, the survey data of institutions reopening plans are that at a, at a minimum 63% and at the high number I saw was 70 or 70% of institutions are planning for a face-to-face -face reopening. That will have an interesting, um, depending on how COVID goes and what happens, it will be very interesting to see um, how they begin to incorporate a hybrid approach. And I'll talk about that uh, just as an example um, after Rick talks about physical, digital, experiential. It sounds interesting. Hey, Tom, how did we go with uh, that first poll question? Looks like matching pretty much what Lander just said, uh, uh, approaching 70% likely and definitely. Mm -hmm. and any comments from the panel on, on those responses? Well, I'm certainly not surprised. Um, all the survey data I've been collecting every week is saying that. The question is going to be, how do we get into the details of it? And I think that MSU was, um, and Sabrina uh, was talking about that, and many of our institutions are doing those things, including what Rob mentioned about uh, paying attention to healthy buildings. Right. Yeah, if I could just comment quick, Steve, I think it's really gonna depend um, on how we pay attention over the next few weeks. As we see across the country, the numbers changing. Um, we have to be agile and adaptable um knowing what could come and being willing to learn from that as we go yeah so let's now um move to what Lance is referring to here rick you frequently talk about a need for balance and the importance of how facilities can enable success or student success what what is the right mix here between these yeah we 
we're probably trying to figure that out. As part of our vision for 2030 and the path we are on to kind of change direction uh, for us as an institution, we've been talking about finding the right balance between digital, physical, and experiential. As a college, as I mentioned earlier, we pride ourselves or differentiate ourselves uh, based on the hands-on applied learning. So we know we need a physical component to it, but the reality, I think, that the definition of physical has morphed based on the last uh, couple of months of experience. Experiential, though traditionally that means in a lab or with an employer, like a work integrated learning component, even that will look very differently. And we're actually working on a project with Microsoft to look at virtual reality and augmented reality and kind of gamification on how can we deliver experiential learning without necessarily having to go out to an employer or not have to uh, rely on our labs. Today, we're very quickly and rapidly had to move to a very digital environment, but we also know that that's not where we want to be. So figuring out what that balance is and on the back of this, completely reimagining our uh, campus plan and a vision of how we think about our relatively small but uh, mighty 2 million square feet downtown Toronto facilities um, is, is kind of a, a, a big prime. And coming back to the, some of the discussions around COVID, and although that worries us, getting back is important, but I think we're almost more worried about what's after. Um, assuming that things will be better, in one way or another, they will be better. Uh, at worst, we're just used to the new normal, but going back and being the educational institution that we were three months ago, I think would be a mistake. And not just for us, I think for the education sector. If we don't take this as an opportunity to reimagine who we are, what we do, how we contribute to the future of work, and then what type of mix of physical, digital, and experiential uh, services and experiences provide. If we don't reimagine that, I think we will have uh, missed an opportunity and will be less relevant in the future than we were ever before. So to that point, Lander, with you mentioned earlier the, the role of facilities now being more important than ever before, how, how do we strike the, the balance that Rick is looking for here? Well, it's interesting. There's a short term and there's a long term. We'll talk about the long term um, in a, another slide around master plans, Steve. But the short term is that I don't know of any institution that is planning to go face to face that doesn't have a hybrid approach to learning, which is incorporating physical, digital and experiential. And so they were thinking about let's break down large um, classes. You can't have 150, 200, 300 people in a class that, that's just not going to work anymore. So they'll deliver a hybrid model with uh, asynchronous and synchronous online uh, learning modalities, along with staggered schedules for the students to come in and be in smaller face-to-face -face, um, uh, classrooms. And so they are able to reduce density, which is clearly one of the goals, social distancing, physical distancing, et cetera, on, and still be able to offer um, a, a, an experiential um, approach to this. I think Rick's absolutely right. If we don't um, work really hard at finding the right blend, we're going to be lost in this. Student success, so that's at the center of this. Digital, digital means that not only are the faculty trained to deliver this, we also have a digital divide. And that divide is real in terms of students that do not have access to sitting in the parking lot to get Wi-Fi. Um, so it is a, uh, it's a real issue for the higher education if we can reimagine it in ways that redesign so that everyone has digital access in a meaningful sort of way. So these approaches provide what I think at least initially um, a blend of that physical and digital to achieve an experiential part that really um, helps us achieve a balance right now, but we're going to have to totally rethink it as, and I'm going to use this phrase, the whole student. The whole student yep. in the entirety of um, delivering a consistent um, student experience. I, I like that you referenced that the, the student is, is central here, and we're, we're working around this thing here, that Rick, these considerations you've put forward uh, for student success was developed by George Brown College. Um, pre-COVID times, this was done, I'm not sure when you've actually developed this, but 
what made health promotion number two on, on the list then and, and how has it changed for today? Since we did this before COVID, yeah, or, <laughs> pardon me, um, we would argue it was always a priority, and it was. <clears throat> um, and a little bit to Lander's point, uh, we need to look at the experience we provide through the lens of the whole student. It's not just the, the little time they get when they sit in the classroom and, and learn a piece of theory. It's everything from their experience on and off campus to the services, cafeteria, bookstore, libraries, the community spaces. Um, so really taking a student-centered or learner-centered approach to every decision we made, including what we think the future of teaching and learning and the future of our campus is. Uh, you see a kind of six dimensions that we have earmarked and basically said everything we do and every investment we make and every capital dollar we spend needs to be connected to some of this because if it doesn't contribute to a transformational experience of our students, we will certainly in the long run miss the boat. And thinking about um, health promoting and health as a as a kind of a key aspect, um, there's plenty of studies, and I'm sure Lender can name them all, but that demonstrate that learners actually learn better in environments where health and um, it are properly incorporated. So, for us, health promoting focus, focusing on the health and well-being of our students um, and their experiences on and off campus is a, a major driver for us to think about our spaces and our capital projects on, on campus. Interesting, and especially with Rob's earlier comment around um, the, the, the pivot towards healthy, healthy buildings, it's a new dimension of how we're looking at the infrastructure and the environments that we facilitate. Um, but let's just go a little bit deeper into, into those um, environments. And Lander, an interesting fact that I heard recently was um, the classroom only represents less than 10% of the campus overall usage. Is that true? And where are the other valuable areas that are on campus? So let me uh, let me bridge from what Rick just said about the health uh, part, and that's around well-being and mental health. You know, it's the elephant in the room at the moment, and we really have to recognize that the stressors associated with the world in which we live right now will negatively affect our um, creativity, innovation, and productivity, whether you're the worker or whether you are the student. So focusing on that is going to be critically important for all of us. So let me go to your slide right now and what you're, you're talking about. That is absolutely correct. As a matter of fact, um, if you know the data around space, classrooms for um, community college, let's say, might be at 9% of total space. Um, for many of our large research institutions, it ranges anywhere from four to six. And so we spend a ton of time focused on trying to control that one controlled environment um, of campus space. It's seemingly controllable. It's difficult to control how students will be managed through that classroom experience, it's, but it's still controllable. But then I want to talk to you about the trick, what I think is the real battle here, is what are you doing in terms of your plans um, to use the rest of the campus space? So you're seeing that whole campus space and the rest of it when students are actually on the move. That's when the chaos begins. That's what I'm calling it. Um, because uh, let's say that the rest of the space is, do you think that in the synchronous and asynchronous deliveries of these larger classes that they're going to go back to their dorm and, and study? They're not. They're going to go to what Emmanuel just said about um, creative collisions about uh, accidental learning. They're going to go to neighborhoods in which they can get re-engaged. They're going to study in the parking lot. They're going to study all over the campus. And so the, the way I want people to think about is the whole campus is now the learning environment. That's a critical thing to think about, requiring a much more dynamic approach, um, especially with respect to COVID. And to me, it's exciting to think outside of the classroom and that the traditional ways of, of thinking about space and learning have all been exploded. So uh, my example would be around intentionally creating learning neighborhoods. Manuel, you mentioned that. Um, at those intersections where people will, um, we call them creative, collaborative learning collisions, 
I mean, it's those kinds of things that we want to develop. And a colleague of mine at the University of Iowa said, we actually have to consider an, an internal pedestrian circulation plan. That's exciting. Yep, yep. So really, really interesting is that that thing you're talking about, Andrew, the campus master plan, is that commonplace now for facilities? Is that something that everybody has or is developing? I think most people have one. It ends up on the shelf. It does not end up being the tool. And I see Sabrina's nodding and saying, everybody knows we developed this incredible plan and then we put it on the shelf. It's not a living document. I think that's what we want right. to do. Is we want a living document. It needs to be modified dramatically to address traversing to and from classrooms and traversing across the campus. That is something right. we've learned through this COVID experience. See, yeah, I just add to it. I have to land this point, and I think the you said it very beautifully, Landa. You know, the the whole concept is making the campus as a whole a place to learn, grow, and to be productive, right? And this is something that we paid close attention to as well, because it's not just about people working in a physical space in a building, coming together intentionally, talking, collaborating. They should be able to be productive and empowered at any space on the campus. They feel that they can collaborate much better in an open space on a field or under a tree or in a parking lot. How are we going to enable that? And that's where the, the union of digital technology empowering physical spaces starts to come in. And you can't separate the two, right? Because ultimately, as human beings, I will do best in a place I choose to do my best in. Right. It's our role to provide those facilities and that ambience and that environment so people can be better empowered compared to what they're at today. Uh, Emmanuel, on that point, is, is there an argument that suggests that because I'm in a campus environment with a lot more space, it offers uh, increased availability for physical distancing? There, there could be. Uh, and, you know, ultimately it's about the... More space, less space, I think it's about how we consume that space. And on a campus, if I'm able to use any space of that campus rather than just having two chairs and a table sitting in a conference room, I can have a lot more space to be able to interact safer and more cleaner with a lot more people. But, but the key analogy, for us, analogy here for corporate campus, the fact that the classroom is the meeting room, is that what we're comparing here? So I would even compare, I would even extend that and say we're not only talking about meeting rooms, we're talking about lobby spaces, we're talking about cafeterias, we're talking about walkways, right? Because then someone walks across you all and hey, you know what, I wanted to ask you something, why don't we talk about this? So every physical space in the building that we have in the corporate world, you know, should easily map to, uh, to an educational campus as well, driving that spontaneous combustive collaboration and the interaction that we all strive for. And, and Steve, I would say that we all know that space utilization numbers are really low. They're actually average 47%. That's a scary thing. Um, Rick has talked about this before when it comes to utilizing our space. If we can think about the whole campus and the whole, we have an opportunity right now to actually not as an obstacle, but as an opportunity to change the mindset around space. Who owns it? Who controls it? What do we do with it? Et cetera. This is our opportunity. And so that leads to um, this rather reveal of all those other spaces, if you like. Um, your organization is constantly being asked to leverage existing building infrastructure to make it smart. What strategies can education institutions employ to adapt their current facilities to produce safer and more productive spaces? It, it's, a, it's a great question. And as I've been listening to this conversation, uh, you, you, what, what we find helpful is, is, is stepping back and looking at the problems that we're that we're trying to solve here, right? We we talk about health problems, uh, the, the spontaneous uh, collaboration that Emmanuel uh, spoke of, um, the need to have hybrid learning, uh, the lower utilization of space. Forty-seven percent, I think Lander just just mentioned. There, there, there. The, the the list of of challenges or opportunities problems whatever you want to call them is is growing um in an uncertain future i think as you said at the beginning lander um but there's a bit of good news here and and that is whether it be staff offices or housing labs or the entrance to a building or uh, or what whatever the space may be there's a good amount of what i would 
what we would call operational technology or from the facility management systems in any type of building, whether it be campus, office, it, it, government, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter, that can allow us to leverage uh, existing systems, if you will, um, if we can first understand the problems that we're trying to solve. And that, this really excites me because we're, we're talking about the, this uh, experience that, that Rick has uh, alluded to around physical and digital and experiential. Um, and we, we need to first understand that direction so that we can address the whole in whole student terms as we talked about. But then we, what, what, what's exciting is from a technology perspective, is we have the ability to quickly, I'll call it, x-ray the existing infrastructure within these buildings so we can get the maximum dollar out of what we're trying what we're trying to do with these spaces. So what so that allows you to have a thoughtful uh, investment because what what we have seen is that there's a bit of a uh, of a panic at first as to, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? And being able to step back and uh, get some visibility, uh, of, of what existing capabilities you have allows you to uh, take, adva take advantage of a lot of things that have not been taken advantage of before to solve this 47% utilization problem, as an example. Yep. Uh, you make a good point in bringing operational technology with inf information technology together. And I understand the, the concept of starting with the use case, but a lot of people do start with the technology. And I think um, maybe Sabrina, with, with the rapid pace of technology and the explosion of IoT, how does your team of facilities professionals stay current and engaged with new systems and approaches? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think everyone that I've talked to recognizes this, that the use of technology has been critical to any response to COVID and will be critical every day going forward. But to your point, uh, it's only as useful as um, our staff's ability to uh, pick that up, use it effectively and, and move forward and be willing to learn. Um, so pre-COVID, we were lucky enough to be moving down a path of defining and implementing a smart campus uh, strategy. And one of the ways that we had been using technology every single day was through mobile devices in the hands of each of our facility staff members, equipped with tools and applications that allowed them to do their work. Uh, so these devices really became the most important facilities tool during COVID. It kept everyone connected and informed, but it also provided ways of earning a paycheck when our staff were not allowed on campus. And so from this, what we've seen is that that um, kind of forced hand of nature uh, has increased our capability and our willingness uh, in our staff members around the adaptability and learning of new tools. And we know that when individuals become more agile and adaptable with technology, every organizational change you try to make becomes more manageable. And our teams become more empowered to innovate and become the leaders uh, of campus. And we've, we've seen some anecdotal evidence of that. So in the next evolution of normal, technology will continue to be a utility. Um, and it's more important than ever that our staff are outfitted with the technology tools and skills because our infrastructures, our buildings, and our everyday operations will hinge on our ability to use it. Um, so one of the silver linings of COVID uh, is that it's given us a push to be more prepared for the change into the next normal, um, to be a little bit easier, um, because we won't ever see a day in which technology isn't a major component of any of our worlds. Very cool. And then, Rick, I assume it's the same at George Brown? Yeah, we're probably a little bit uh, behind as to what uh, Sabrina is talking about. Uh, we have a predominantly older campus uh, with buildings, and I'm sure Sabrina does too, uh, buildings that are 50 years old or older, uh, that's how old our institution is, combined with buildings that are four years old have the latest and greatest. So we're trying to bring our, our staff uh, up to speed and along. I don't think we have taken full advantage yet of Internet of Things and smart building concepts to better manage uh, the performance of our spaces and ultimately maybe better manage the utilization of our spaces. But I agree with Sabrina that I do not see a future where we don't uh, embrace this and make this part of our, uh, of our normal operations. And for that, we have recently put together our facilities team and our IT team. They will be one because they're so in the interdependent as to creating the 
physical, digital, and experiential experiences to our students that we think as an infrastructure engine, we need to uh, also organizationally make the changes and shifts that are, are going to be required to take full advantage of all this. That, that's very interesting. We've seen that in the enterprise space when you combine the, uh, the leadership under one for IT and OT, it, it does establish mm -hmm. a lot of change. So why don't we ask the audience um, on our second poll question here. Um, Tom, if you don't mind putting that one up. How would you describe your campus facilities approach to embracing new technology? Is it proactive, open, perhaps it's indifferent, closed or even negative? And while you're um, answering that, maybe back to you, Serena, continuing with your, your earlier thought, why would facilities perhaps hesitate to embrace new technologies? Most honestly and plainly, Steve, change is hard. Uh, so embracing technology is, a, is in ways that produce a long-term strategy a plan and a healthy ROI for all stakeholders, not just facilities, um, takes cultural change and the entire institution has to work together. So again, it's not a um, facility strategy, it's not a learning strategy, it is a campus strategy. So in many examples from the facilities lens though, uh, historically we've been able to do our jobs without the use of technology. In fact, physical tools and solutions have always been the priority. Yep. Um, and historically, facilities organizations are reactive. Until recent years, we were not always a leader or even an active participant at the table. Technology for campuses is something that happens in long range planning, um, which hasn't really been a priority until this last decade. And finally, it seems expensive. Uh, the investment seems complex and the ROI seems low at, at face value. Um, but if done right with an integrated master campus plan, um, the investment can pr produce a really great ROI in the long term. Or even short term, we hope. Um, so yeah. Um, Tom, how did we go with the uh, audience response to that one? Looks like 54% are open to new technologies, and uh, second place, 27% are proactive. Excellent. We've got a good crowd here today. Everyone's leaning in, and um, as we talk about leaning in, Landa, um, one thing that uh, you recently shared, some insights from APA around what appears to be a simple framework I believe everyone on the call should, should benefit from this one. Um, can you walk us through how this process can offer students increased safety, health, and well-being? Yes, and uh, I want to bridge from what Sabrina just said in, in terms of the um, leadership that's required and the fact that it's culture. We talked about that at the Smart Campus Strategy Summit that it was about having a leadership strategy and ensuring that we recognize that the culture is the real barrier. And the culture has been the real barrier. However, we had an incredible opportunity in front of us um, with, uh, the, with COVID to truly change that. So when you see this slide, it can look like a whole lot of stuff, but let me give you an illustration first. Um, and that is, I had the opportunity to listen last night to an interview with Tom Hanks. He's recorded, regarded as America's dad. Um, he did Mr. Rogers in that movie. Um, and he's just such a great guy. And in that interview, he's asked about his experience having contracted COVID and with his wife as well, this uh, last February and March, and specifically the debate about wearing masks. I have a point here. Is that he said, um, he said it was disappointing. Now that's such a nice <laughs> way to say it, right? But he said, there's a part that we can all play and that we can be a part of a national effort. And he said it was very disconcerting to him that for something as simple as, and doing as little as, wearing a mask, social distancing, and washing your hands, that it's entered into any kind of fray and not just being something that we do for each other. And so that sort of sets up the, the slide when it comes to safety, health, and well-being because it's very behavioral, right? It is very, not only individual, but it is for the collective good. So how do we create this behavioral and consistent experience across the entire delivery system? I think there are four things that we can focus on and consider. One is about having a set of rules. I know people don't like rules. Okay, get over it. You know, you get in your car, you drive 95 miles an hour, um, you're gonna get a speeding ticket. There's a rule, okay? So it's okay to have rules. 
So um, the example I have is just wearing a face mask. A face mask. Anything that has a door should require a face mask, right? That's a, that's pretty simple. Adopting protocols. Uh, and a protocol could be the six foot um, physical distancing, paying attention to contact duration. Contact duration greater than um, 15 minutes tells us something about how physically distanced do we need to be, and we're suggesting maybe 12 feet. Adopting processes. Plexiglass shields is one way or they are talking about it, although that's getting a little dicey with the aerosolized particles that we're hearing about right now, maybe giving faculty lavaliers so they're not having to scream out to the group. I mean, there are little things that we can do, but they're important. And then finally, communication, 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 because it aids and assists through um, all the messaging that we need to do. Signage needs to be clear, consistent, um, concise, um, and, and frankly, I learned this from Adam Lover, Sabrina, at your institution. He said that in facilities, we will model the behaviors that we want others to follow. Follow. There's no reason why facility staff can't lead the way because the bottom line is what we're really um, talking about that's most important is it's less about enforcing and more about informing to create the behavioral change that we're looking for, Stephen. Yeah, behavioral change is, is such a challenge, and uh, Sabrina referred to, to change being the challenge, and, and part of that change, I think, um, Sabrina, has is, is got to do with um, the various stakeholders. So one thing we've not touched on is the complexity of decision-making, and the question I have for maybe for yourself is, who owns a smart campus strategy? And I think in the case here, we're talking about a COVID team, and who owns that collective decision making? Yeah, Steve, your question is an important one. And so I'm going to reference the thing that I've said uh, this entire time that it is called a smart campus strategy for a reason, not a smart facility strategy or anything else. Um, and that's because it really needs to be owned by the leaders of our campuses. It is important that senior leaders across the various areas and units of higher education institutions are working together to make the decisions that are gonna affect our students, our staff, and the faculty who occupy these buildings and spaces every single day. And recognizing that those individuals that occupy those spaces determine the success um, of our future. Uh, so we are responsible from a facilities perspective for planning, building, maintaining, energizing, but most importantly, providing a safe environment for our campus community. Um, so we have been working together uh, with our academic and other unit leaders um, to increase our chances of success and to recognize that not working with them um, in making these decisions is one of the biggest barriers that we can put out there in front of ourselves. So on the screen that you, that you have up, that's really the steps that Michigan State University has laid out for the charge. Um, and we currently have a set of subcommittees tackling each of the challenges presented by COVID-19 and a re-entry to campus. Um, so it takes a lot of people and a lot of meetings and a lot of time. Um, yep. But I believe that we recognize that we all have, we have to get this right together um, because our community and our students are really depending on us. And, and later what Sabrina is referring to, isn't, isn't that what you were trying to achieve anyway at the um, Smart Campus Strategy Summit? Yeah, I think it's really wonderful. The Smart Campus Strategy Summit was focused on developing an enterprise-wide technology strategy. We're to engage in an institutional collaboration with your IT folks. Rick, I would suggest that you are ahead of everybody with what you just did organizationally mm -hmm. is frankly amazing, so give yourself some credit. And then the Smart Campus requires broad-based leadership and collaboration to achieve the essential business solutions that Rob was talking about, and I'm going to use the phrase doing different with less. Nah, just quit saying whatever. I'm not even say out loud what everybody says. Do different with less for the future of your institutions, your organizations, your companies. Emmanuel, you helped us at Smart Campus Strategies to think quite differently about how we can deal with our spaces and have better business solutions associated with us. So I'm pretty excited about where we are right now, Stephen. Yeah, speak, speaking of Emmanuel, he did help us with that, that conversation. The framework that Landis suggested earlier, Emmanuel, makes a lot of sense. And just like a campus master, master plan we spoke of earlier, it's all about the student, right? So if that's the case, what can we learn from the corporate world 
that can apply to a better student journey and experience. Yeah, that's that's a great point, and thank you so much, Landa, for that. Uh, and the the view for us is when we talk about the corporate world and we talk about the employee experience, okay, experience does not start from the moment they come inside a building or they go into a room at an office. The experience starts from the moment they wake up and they get ready to come down to work. So when we start talking about it, we start looking at what is the best way for a person to get to the office? What are the options he would like to prefer? Would he like to take a bus? Would he like to walk? Would he like to drive down? And these are some of the choices students are faced with all the time, right? How do I get to the university campus on time? How can I get it in a way that aligns to my goals and to my needs, you know, as someone who's focused on sustainability, someone who wants to say, you know, I would like to live a healthier lifestyle. To Rick's earlier point, you know, health and wellness is a big deal for us today. It's, it's always been a big deal, but the focus is how do we drive emotional and physical well-being of anybody that comes onto that campus? Now, once I come there, the, the biggest priority is where do I park? If I park my car, am I going to lose it? You know, in case I forget where I park my car. And you know, some of our campuses that, that we're building on Redmond is huge, right? You've got a couple of thousand parking lots and parking bays. How do I find that car? Now, once I get inside, how do I get to my room and find the person that I'm looking for? And the same thing with students. With the sprawl of academic campuses today and the size they're at, how is a student going to go from building to building? How is he going to find the class that he's looking for? Once they are in and once they come down, we spoke about the lobby experience. When I come to a lobby, a lobby is not just a nice place where people come and they ask, hey, look, I'm looking for someone, but it's a place to drive engagement. It's a place to drive collaboration. It's also a place to measure sentiments. When people walk into a building, are they happy? Are they frustrated? Are they sad? Are they looking for something with desperation? Right? And how do we drive better student experience when a student walks in? Is he completely lost? Because when I spoke with a couple of universities, they all say that the ability for us to have a positive experience by welcoming a student at the lobby of the building is going to drive the future engagement that they would have. Finally, once they get into the building, how are they going to go about finding a space that suits their needs? And when we talk about collaboration, collaboration is not just a one-way traffic. You've got different forms of collaboration. You've got brainstorming. You've got formal learning. You've got you know one-on-one -on -one meetings or mentorship. All that requires different types of spaces. Using that space, coming together, and at the end of it all, nothing is going to take away individual focus time. So students have to study by themselves, just like how corporate workers have to spend time thinking about it. How do I plan for that quiet time in a completely crowded, empowered building? How do I allow for that provision of space to take place? And finally, at the end of the day, how am I going to get that person back home safely? Without having to worry, will I be late for my bus? If I take this class, am I going to miss something? Right? Is the bus going to be extremely crowded today? What are the route options that I have? So driving that experience from the time you wake up, you get ready, and go back home is what we talk about integrated student or worker journeys. Interesting. Door to door, and, and I think the thing that comes out for me on that discussion is everything you guys are talking about with, with the master plan. But in order to enable that master plan, Rick, we really need to look at the, uh, the technology aspect of a smart campus and creating that, not throwing technology at the wall and hope it sticks, but that homogenous, seamless technology. And I know um, you, yourself as an ex-Cisco professional have a lot of experience in this area. What I want to ask you is where did we get to pre-COVID with leveraging converged technology? And how does convergence perhaps better enable us to cope in a pandemic mode? Yeah, I, I don't know if COVID in itself makes a big change other than maybe adopting and embracing faster. The journey of technology convergence, IP enabling, marrying the world of IT and the world of operations and facilities was well on its way. Slow though, for all the reasons Sabrina mentioned, cultural shifts, uh, you know, people in the real estate sector have been building buildings for, for hundreds of years and done very well. They didn't need all this technology. I think tying this to the right business case, which is kind of what Emmanuel spoke about, really understanding the journey, the experiences we want to give and how technology can contribute that. It doesn't always have to be a technology solution there's lots of ways we can completely transform a student experience 
But I know from our perspective, having all these different facilities and not having their not being able to manage their performance well, and by, and by the way, also having a set of facilities that are really only open 210 days per year, mostly from Mondays to Thursdays, because we don't like to learn or teach on Friday, we have this 2 million square feet sitting in one of the most expensive cities in Canada, if not more North America, um, that I think is screaming for innovative new business models. And what we then see with the technology convergence, the enablement of marrying these two worlds of facilities and IT, I think is going to give us, is already, by the way, having all the tools that we that we need. I don't think we need anything more. It's there. It's now just putting the right heads together to actually go and, and, and make some hay. And I think what you're talking about, again, all the dots, it's all connected. And we're seeing IP and IT really be the, the the foundation to the fourth utility or the foundation to drive all this all we need to do is uh go and do it and i think well, Sabrina, so you know, you're set up to do that with the way you converge your teams and you're thinking of one, one particular uh, we, we we try and i think it's the first step but based on earlier conversations and sabrina mentioning this is a campus plan not a facilities plan i think historically in our institution facilities and it did not have the agency to drive change we were there to clean the buildings to make the wi-fi work get out of the way that was what we were doing so to elevate the combined conversation to we can do so much more that truly contributes to the student experience beyond new carpets uh, and a digital display in the classroom, I think is a shift that we are just, frankly, at the beginning uh, of making. Let's take that a, a step further with Emmanuel, um, with digital transformation. As we break down the student journey and look at the digital experience, walk us through the key steps that begin with perhaps the shell and core of the environment and ultimately lead to better student experiences. Yeah, the, okay, the ultimate, goal for us, Steve, here is how are you going to make a building or a campus smart from the ground up? You have to design them to be smart. You have to design them to be engaging. So the very first step that we talk about is coming out of the plan. Plan starts with infrastructure, uh, core systems, uh, devices that go into the building, the structure, the layout of the building. As we move up, we then start talking about buildings, unlike technology, last for a very long time, right? You've got buildings that live for 30, 40, 50, probably even 100 years. And so when we talk about technology refresh in a building and we talk about future-proofing with a building, it's a very hard thing to say. Buildings will live the course. So for us, it's about how do we design the building so that the building can dynamically adapt to the changing needs of a different generation of people that will go through that building, especially in a university context, right? You've got students with different age groups coming through all the time. Then supporting that, I, Rick, you had a beautiful slide early on where you talked about convergence of the infrastructure, right? And that really hits it home for us today because ultimately, how are we going to converge infrastructure so that we can drive optimization and efficiency? To, okay, in the past, we all spoke about data. Today, we're talking about power and data. Power and data driving experiences, all that coming through together. These are the options where we then say that, what infrastructure do I need to drive positive experiences? Finally, at the end of it all, Silo-based systems still exist, right? And you still need core silo-based systems. You've got your HVACs. Uh, we spoke about filters for the air. Now, okay, at the end of it, how am I going to consolidate all of that data? Because ultimately, I've got specialized systems. Bringing it on a platform that would allow me to weave all the data together and driving that experience is what we're after. So in a nutshell, it's not about starting left to right or right to left. It's about saying that, what experiences do I want to have? And to drive those experiences, how is the physical world going to come together with the digital world? And that is the union that is going to make it a smart campus or a smart building. Mm -hmm. And then I suppose there's another aspect besides experiential is, is this logical world. And Rob, there's, in diving a little bit deeper into the layers of technology, there's a lot of platforms available today that offer building operators better visibility into their environments. Um, so how do campus facilities and IT work together to enjoy the benefit of this type of information without it becoming analysis paralysis? Well, I, I think we're, we're, we're 
saying a consistent theme here. You got to start with what the the purpose is that you're trying to achieve. And there there uh, several several of us have mentioned this cultural clash, and that that comes together by looking at a a shared purpose. Um, and a lot of times, what we've seen in the past is that we start it by looking at the the, the technology, um, and you sort of got to turn that upside down. And in order to bring all this together, you got to start by looking at the shared purpose, and everything else sort of falls uh, through that. So I, the people is the biggest challenge. Rick mentioned the technology exists. Everything that you see here um, exists a lot of times on the campus in silos. And we have the ability to bring that all together if we can get the different stakeholders aligned, as Sabrina talked about. We are running out of time here, but this is a great conversation. I don't want to interrupt it. Emmanuel, just based on what Rob just said, how do we know what is the right type of data to be collecting? So, you know, ultimately, the, the right type of data, we have data all the time. Buildings are treasure troves of data. They collect thousands of points of data every year. The key for us is aligning the type of experience you want to provide. If you want to provide someone with okay, integrated access to your building, booking a room, navigating to the room, finding the person that you want, you're going to have data across multiple systems, right from the BMS to the indoor navigation system to the room booking system and even to the to the AHUs, right? You're adjusting the airflow that comes into the room. Weaving all that together is what we are after, right? So not just collecting data for data's sake, but using the data that is going to drive the experience that then empowers the users that we have. The other point that I want to just touch on what Rob said is there's been this huge talk where we talk about new buildings and new campuses, but a large portion of our portfolio today is comprised of old buildings, right? And those are a critical part of the assets. So what we try to do is how are you going to modernize existing buildings? And the modernization of the existing buildings rests on the foundation of what experience do you want to drive and what systems I have in those buildings across which I can unite those data flows. Quick, quick five seconds on that, Rob. Um, Sabrina was saying long-term ROI. I did pick up on that. Um, and Emmanuel there is referring to leveraging existing buildings. This process of smart campus doesn't have to cost the bank, right? And no, it, it doesn't. And uh, you can leverage existing you can leverage existing technologies because the majority of a campus today, if you're going to make it smart, already exists. Right. So speaking of leveraging existing technologies, here's a pragmatic way of dealing with today's problem. Can you quickly walk us through what this strategy is for facility public health? Sure, sure. And I, I think uh, the audience is probably here. We we all believe that healthy buildings is is a, a, a outcome of the pandemic. And the most important thing we need to do is take action by leveraging existing capabilities yet as we've heard, we're in uncertain times and we have a lot of uh, time compression. So what, what we have found is that the, the first thing that uh, folks are experiencing is what is the immediate action that I can take? And one of, one of the things you can do without implementing technology in the building is provide a way to, to the contractors and the, and the facility staff to at least um, acknowledge from a behavioral standpoint that they aren't sick. And uh, what, once, once we're able to do that, we can talk about things that we're, we are all saying here is, okay, what are my uh, use cases and business reasons for taking action and select from those? And then figure out in a very rapid way, what is my existing technology and where is that gap? And how can I go address that and put together an orderly strategy, as Sabrina has suggested? And then if we do that correctly, um, we can continue to monitor and manage the health of these buildings. And I'll, and I'll cl close with this, Steve, is that uh, if you think about what we're talking about in 90% of our time spent indoors, I, I challenge the audience to think about who may be more important. Um, in the student's life uh, from a health perspective, the, the doctors or your facility managers? Great, great thought, Rob. Um, sensitive to time here and clearly lots of strategy, product, technology approaches on the table. One thing is for certain, the complexity as complexity increases, the demand for value rises and we need to adapt 
to innovative supply chain strategies that ultimately can enhance installation integration, improve efficiency of deployment models and treat the campus with more deliberate programmatic and perhaps long-term vision. Annex has responded to the changing market dynamics here with a, a big focus on well-planned resilient supply chain strategies. One thing we can add to this when it comes to uh, the affordability that Sabrina was referring to um, on the ROI um, for working capital is, is leveraging resources like the CARES Act and other campus green tech lenders that are providing models for zero capital outlay programs. So there's a lot of opportunities on the table that we can peel back here um, to, to get it done. We have run out of time. So unfortunately, uh, I have been looking at the panel. There's, there's a dozen questions or so in there that we want to get back to you on. Folks, I'm uh, stopping the recording at this time. and. Uh... Uh, so that uh, we can have our own questions on this. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing screen. Uh, folks, I'm uh, uh, stopping the recording at this time and uh, bringing you all back into the, uh, uh, the discussion here. I've opened up the uh, mic for Steve, um, uh, uh, Steve Anson from uh, and Andy uh, Jimenez from Annexter, and also uh, Lander Medellin is on, on uh, as well. If uh, you have questions for her, but um, you know, I'm mostly cu curious uh, about uh, Steve and, and Andy. Uh, now that we've had a uh, most of a full first semester back to campus, how um, how our uh, viewers and and what you're experiencing, what you're seeing as well. Uh, for how how this is held up held up and uh, and as we uh, as our facilities managers plan to uh, prepare for a second semester sometime in January or whenever um, uh, you know how how this might be adjusted as they go forward uh, Steve I'll leave it leave it to you yeah thanks Steve thanks for the opportunity here I think the interesting thing here is we've been able to see uh, these um, adaptation occur in various environments, not just the campus. So whether it's hospitals, obviously there was a lot more urgency now that they're being refocused on right now with a new uptick in, in cases. But then we look at the um, the office and there's been a lot of adaptation there as well. So um, I'll let Andy comment on some of the technology aspects of it, but at a high level, we've been able to enjoy um, different approaches, some, some being a, a bit on the back foot and sort of shut the place down. The other ones of uh, organizations have really invested and used the time now to invest in, in technology. While, while the spaces are empty, they've repurposed that open plan office and uh, taken that meeting room density and, and uh, shared it across the floor. Some of these more essential businesses are, are still working in their office environments under um, under under duress, but also under um, under under some form of stress where people are concerned, but they're they're behaving in the way that Lander described in that that video recording. Um, I'll let Lander comment as to the uh, what she's seen of late as to the campus evolution, but we know technology, as we talked about, smart campus or smart office is playing a role to help people do what they need to do. And Andy, I'll, I'll pass on, on to you some ex great examples that we've seen with technology. Yeah, thanks, Steve. And I, I think I'll probably delineate uh, between the office environment versus um, the campus environment, because I think in the office environment, uh, certainly new technologies, and these, these were discussed uh, on the, on the uh, webinar by Rob Murkison, uh, are being deployed. So things like, um, your temperature screening cameras, for instance, uh, at the entrances of the building. Uh, there's people counting software, social distancing analytics that are being deployed to ensure that um, you know, you're not exceeding uh, perhaps the CDC guidelines for occupancy. And if you've got folks in a given space that they're keeping their distance, I mean, these are things that are being you know, deployed right now uh, in commercial spaces. But, but I will say uh, anecdotally having several uh, family members, both uh, you know nephews and and my son at college, uh, they're just returning from Thanksgiving break. It's interesting to see that you know some of the behavioral um, um, elements that were brought up to really the low tech methods of uh, you know, 
virus mitigation, so things like PPE and social distancing, uh, and, and students adhering to this actually worked. Because uh, at least my experience uh, with my son at St. Louis University is that they, they deployed uh, very strict guidelines in terms of you know, social distancing and um, you know, uh, mask wearing. And for the most of the semester, I think they've seen an uptick as the rest of the country has over the last several weeks. But I think for most of the semester, they were pretty effective. Uh, I think from a campus environment, I think the only negative that I've heard is uh, to support some of the hybrid learning environments, that there wasn't enough your wireless capacity that was deployed across um, the spaces within a campus. So lecture halls, for instance, may have had sufficient capacity, but uh, you go to some of the public spaces and some of the, uh, the dormitories and um, you know, other, where, other areas where, where students congregate, uh, there wasn't enough capacity to, to kind of uh, satisfy the need that the students had uh, to really collaborate and learn in, in a hybrid uh, learning environment. So I think that's one area that I think uh, probably has to be improved to some degree um, is improving you know, capacity of wireless connectivity, both cellular and Wi-Fi, I think have to be improved. But I think you know, overall, uh, I think some of the, the behavioral uh, adjustments that were made on college campuses uh, were pretty effective. And Again, this is my own experience. I'd be interested to see if Lander saw the same thing across the board uh, with other college campuses. But I was really uh, surprised to the degree that uh, several campuses were able to, you know, achieve you know hybrid learning uh, throughout uh, most of the semester without uh, really major incidents. Yeah, I would chime in and say, um, indeed, that was the case. I think what we learned is we had more students in um, the need for the synchronous asynchronous deliveries and less in terms of those larger lecture halls staggered kind of scheduling moved so much more to this smaller sort of classroom, smaller um, socially distanced setup. Um, and that was really important, but it was that, it was how did we do that hybrid piece really effectively? We probably really ramped up well to to stagger the classroom deliveries. The problem was that we had a more need for the delivery of the courses, the lectures, et cetera, even if you had quarantine isolation um, kids. But we needed um, a better setup for the hybrid. Um, and we didn't have that rolling as well to match the pedagogy, to match the need to match the staggered, to match, you know, so we're learning that the hybrid setup, um, we've got to augment better. I think you're right, Andy, about the, just the whole bandwidth issue. You know, we're not a Starbucks. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Starbucks and there you are, you know, you have all your setup and you're ready to go. Well, um, and Lander, I think is really interesting when you talked about it and so did Rick is the the philosophy of a smart campus, those that had that trajectory in mind pre-COVID were in a much better position to, to pivot, right? So I, I can see that when Rick talks about it from George Brown, he was suggesting that they've, they're pretty much rolled out an online remote learning program. There's a question here from Terry, what do you see as the greatest challenge when guiding the entire organization to new systems of thinking especially when it comes to distance learning. So I think having that philosophy that you described, prepared for every future, et cetera, has, has really proven that, right? It has driven that, frankly. Um, I, I think that the more we have learned about that delivery system and the more it has, uh, healthy buildings has resonated with smart buildings, um, the more we're, I, I would add the collaboration piece to Steve, Stephen, um, that the collaboration is on steroids right now between mm. the facilities folks, ITs, student affairs, the academic programs. And that has really helped us be significantly better off than, than was possible, than could have been viewed as possible. So it was thinking about how our buildings place because place matters that can actually deliver a, a positive student experience. I think it's the whole student that we're still struggling with in terms of being able to deliver a really wonderful college experience that we're 
that our um, students are looking for. But that's tough in a uh, pandemic. So I think to, to Steve's earlier question, what have we learned, right? And as we move into towards the end of the year, I think the um, the big lesson here is we never had, you know, we weren't prepared for this and there's no civil bullet, but so much innovation is occurring. And just looking for little micro lessons, if you like, from each of the other adjacent juxtapose healthcare, what they were able to do um, and what they were able to do now in, in cities with um, the DMV and all these other places based on what they had and what they didn't have. I think that's the biggest lesson is the innovation that we can learn from. Yeah, Stephen, the necessity is the mother of invention, one of our town hall uh, panelists said. They said we could move to online. Well, guess what? <laughs> Later we did, right? And I think that if we can view this with a sense of urgency, um, and I think it was Emmanuel and there talked about, or it might have been Rick, that we don't have the agency to between IT and facilities mm -hmm. to move this needle, I think we now have the agency. I think that the reputation the um, of our ability to collaborate and do things that people thought could never be done is now giving us access to forms that never happened before. And uh, Stephen, the other thing that I would comment on is that um, they're, we're using a lot of the technology, GIS, for example, access controls, um, all of the areas that you talk about at Annexter with security, safety and security, all to great advantage um, to augment not only smart but healthy buildings and to prove that we can do this and do it well. So I'm pretty excited about our ability to meet that challenge. Andrew, I think that's a great way to uh, conclude our session. We're at our time and I wanted to remind everybody that uh, we have another set of sessions at two o'clock plus a uh, special talk by uh, Dr. Uh, Will Miller at uh, 3.30, so stay tuned for that. Thank you all for your attendance. Thank you, Steve and Andy and Lander, for your work with the uh, presentation earlier. Thanks, Good day. Steve. Thanks, Steve and Andy. Yep, thank you. See you all. Bye-bye.